and welcome to the European Area Management Society webinar series. Today, we will be addressing the advances in pediatric area management that were triggered by large multicenter prospective studies, the lessons from Nectarine and Pedi Registry. I would like, first of all, to welcome our dearest uh, speakers. First, to talk about the Nectarine study, I introduce you Professor Nicola Visma from the Department of Anesthesia, Unit for Research and Innovation, Instituto Giannina Gaslini, Genova, Italy. Ciao, Nicola. <laughs> Hi. And to talk about the lessons learned from the Pediatric Difficult Intubation Registry, I have the pleasure to welcome Professor Anneli Garcia Marcinkiewicz from the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the United States of America. Hello, Anneli. Hi. Hi. And also my fellow colleagues that will be moderating this session, Maren klein Brugeny consultant in pediatric and pediatric cardiac anesthesia at University Children's Hospital Zurich, Switzerland, and also DMA Switzerland Council representative. Hello, Mahan. Hi there. And also uh, Professor Robert Greif, anesthesiologist uh, at the Bern University Hospital, Switzerland, and my fellow EMS Board of Directors member. Hello, Tino. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you. And so we are now starting and kicking off our fantastic session. Maren, please allow to enlighten our participants the importance of this topic. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here and uh, welcome everybody. Well, I think both for pediatric and non-pediatric anesthetists, um, the pediatric airway is a very crucial topic. And We've been working on that and addressing this and focusing on it for, for a long time, but still both for pediatric and non-pediatric anesthetists, it's um, still one of the crucial points in pediatric anesthesia. So uh, we know that single center studies are important, but these large multi-center studies really give us much better insight into this topic. So I'm very much looking forward to those two presentations. Good. And then I guess it's my turn to tell you who are here with us, how this webinar works. Uh, we will use uh, for your questions, the Q and A function on Zoom. So. You, if you have a question you want to be answered, use the Q&A session. The chat is for you for greeting and say hello, whatever you want, but we will not look at the chat. The Q&A session is the only one we address. Usually we record these sessions and afterwards members of the society can watch this in the uh, members protected area. And each of the speakers uh, sent to us two articles to read about the topic. So there's a lot of material afterwards you could look at in the uh, members areas. And with this, if I have not forgotten anything, Anna Isabel, we could start with the first speaker. Uh, Nicola, you were introduced quite nicely by Anna Isabel. Uh, it's your turn now. Thank you very much, Tino. Thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a true pleasure. It's, it's unfortunate that we still cannot see each other in person, but I'm quite positive for the future. I'm pretty sure that next year we will have a fantastic um, conference in person. In the meantime, I think it's important to share our findings, it is important to share what we have done so far with this multicenter clinical trials. That's why I'm presenting today for the European Association of, of uh, Highway Man Management, the Nectarine study, uh, which you probably heard, uh, it's a, a multicenter study, observational study, which is mainly dedicated to uh, neonates and infants. 
Uh, and Nicola, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. You were very, very keen to know our participants' insights about a particular question, right? Yeah, yes. we have a poll. We so, can start now. Okay. So first of all, there is now a poll for the audience. As soon as it's up, the question is a simply yes and no. Uh, here it is. So the question from Nicola to you is, is direct laryngoscopy your first choice for tracheal intubations in neonates? Simply yes, no. And as soon as the poll is closed, our technician Miguel will show us the results. So please, please click what you do. Okay, Nicolas, I guess while we are waiting for the results, you could continue telling you us your story or from where you are and all this stuff which comes next. Yes, yes. So this, this is the slide that summarizes my life. Here it is Catania, the place where I was born and the city where I did my university and my anesthesia training. Uh, down here, there is Great Ormond Street. It's a famous children's hospital in London where I've been a consultant. I've been working there at the University College of London. And in the middle, the place where I'm still working, which is Gaslini Hospital. It's a nice, large children's hospital, which is in Genova. And on the right side here is the private beach that we have in our hospital. So please come visit us, visit the hospital, and we'll show you also the nice private beach of the hospital. Great. In the meantime, we have the result. Uh, surprising, at least for me, more than 90% of all the audience are using direct laryngoscopy as a first choice for tracheal innovation. And it will be interesting at the end of Nicola's presentation, we have the same question, how this will change. And with this, please, Nicola, you're next. Yes, I, I think, I think, uh, is not that unexpected. And uh, let's see if I may able to change people's mind or if they want to continue with direct laryngoscopy, laryngoscopy even at the end of my presentation. So in the next 20 minutes, I will present the epidemiology of the nectarine study. Some of the results, of course, I will focus on the highway management in neonates and infants. It's a very large study, so there, there's a lot of data. And then we can discuss all together about the future implications and the clinical implication of the nectarine study. You might remember, Tino, that um, uh, the APRICOT was the previous large multicenter clinical trial network, which was supported by the European Society of Anesthesia. And APRICOT involved 261 centers in Europe, and it was published in 2017 in The Lancet. So actually, uh, when we finished the apricot, which, apricot, which included 32,000 patients in this large prospective database, we thought that it was important to continue uh, with another clinical trial network, looking at specifically uh, uh, a very young, pop very young and fragile population, which is the neonatal population. And the reason Nicola, was- Nicola, how, yes. how came this nectarine? Because first you have apricot, and then nectarine. Where yes, did this of co course collaboration at what's the nectarine? <laughs> so, the, of course, there is a clear link between the two CTNs. First of all, the name, uh, Apricon, and then the nectarine. But the re real reason was because we saw through the result of the Apricot that neonates are definitely a completely different population. So if you look at the uh, result, the incidence of critical events from the apricot study, you will see here that, of course, the younger uh, you are, the higher it is the incidence of critical events. However, the distribution of critical events is completely different in the neonatal and infants population. In fact, 
even if the respiratory complications are predominant in the pediatric population, if you look at specifically, specifically the neonatal and the infant's population, you will see here that the distribution of respiratory events looks being uh, uh, smaller than compared with the cardiovascular complication. So it means that they respond to anesthesia to uh, medications, to anesthetic drugs in a completely different way, simply because they, they have a completely different physiology, they have a completely different metabolism. So then we decided that we needed to have a specifically focused study on neonates and infants. Well, when we submitted the nectarine study to the European Society of Anesthesia for a grant, we thought that it was important to uh, answer all these clinical questions. First of all, we wanted to know which is the incidence of critical events in neonates and infants, and we based the critical events on the occurrence of intervention or treatment which are performed by physician or by the anesthetist in charge uh, when something wrong happened. And we also wanted to include in the critical events a difficult intubation. And then we wanted to know which are the clinical conditions which trigger an intervention. And then we followed the patient up for 30 and 90 days to look at specifically morbidity and mortality in uh, neonates and infants 30 and 90 days after the anesthesia is done. Of course, for answering all these questions, we needed to have a large sample and we calculated that we needed to have at least 5,000 neonates and small infants in this larger database. And we included all neonates and infants up to the age of 60 weeks postmenstrual, undergoing any kind of anesthesia, diagnostic, surgical, regional, or general anesthesia, whether it was performed in the intensive care or in the operating room. And how representative are these 5,000 for Europe? Because well, that, you, you aimed for the entire Europe. That's a that's very good question, actually. Uh, just focus, first of all, on the definition of intervention. So I, I told you that the, the intervention is defined as a response to a significant physiological parameter derangement. And in regards to the difficult intubation, we wanted to focus on those intubation which needed at least two unsuccessful attempts of intubation with direct laryngoscopy, regardless the, uh, the view of the larynx of the view of the vocal cords, either expected or unexpected. And then we followed them up uh, according to the uh, predetermined list of critical events, difficulty intubation, uh, uh, oxygenation, alveolar ventilation, glycemia, cardiovascular instability, body temperature, brain oxygenation and, an and anemia, and again, follow up 30 and 90 days in terms of complication and mortality and hospital readmission. Then you asked me if the nectarine study is true representative of the European population. Actually, the answer is quite obvious. It is representative. First of all, because we wanted to pick up all the centers in Europe who are doing neonatal anesthesia. Then it was a very long journey because we opened the call to all the centers in Europe. We had a certain number of response and in the meantime, we built up the protocol, the case report form. We had to prepare an electronic database, blah, blah, blah. It was a very long journal. And we started all the process in 2015 and we had the publication ready in 2020. In terms of representative of Europe, this is the picture of those centers who were participating in the nectarine study, true, a true representative of Europe, because you will see here from this slide that we had patients included in the nectarine study from Portugal to Spain, up to Estonia, Finland, everywhere, north, south, in and west, east and west. So very well representative of Europe, a true snapshot of what is the uh, clinical practice in the neonatal anesthesia. So the overall database included patients from 165 participating centers in 31 countries. And we ended up having a huge number of patients in the database. Look at this. There were 5,609 patients undergoing 
6,500 procedures, so a, a huge amount of patients. Of course, then from this large cohort, we extrapolated those who had a difficult innovation, and we ended up having 262 procedures where the intubation was classified according to the definition, the definition as difficult. Again, even for difficult intubation, it was a true representative because we had difficult intubation from 26 uh, different countries in the 108 participating centers. Looking at specifically the patients who were included in the uh, difficult intubation database, you will see here that uh, the, the gestational age was 38 weeks, and we included patients uh, who are about one month, one between one and two months of, uh, of age, uh, with the average weight of 3.9 kilos. And you will see here that nearly 50% of these children had at least one comorbidity, which is actually what we are dealing with every day in our clinical practice. Well, when we analyzed the incidence of difficult intubation, we saw that the occurrence was quite high and we had 5.8% of incidence of difficult intubation. If you look at this slide, which represents the characteristic of these children, you will see here that 50% of children underwent anesthesia in an elective way. And then there was nearly uh, half and half, 60%, 40% of those who had induction of anesthesia inhalational or intravenous. 30% uh, had no neuromuscular block, 70% were under neuromuscular block. What it was really surprising, it was that you will see here that 50% of the difficult intubation had a grade one and two Cormac Lehen score. So it means that even if the operator uh, was able to look at the, to see the larynx in a proper way, it, the tube was not passed for some reason, which we'll discuss at the end of my presentation. And then uh, what was also surprising was that uh, even 50% of the difficult intubation cases were not um, expected. Look at this, there were only 30% of difficult intubation which were planned and 70% which were not planned, unplanned difficult intubation. So Nicola, you have a, a huge amount of data. What is for you, what are the most important findings which, which, which are also unexpected for you. So what was the most important for you? Well, uh, Tino, I'll tell you honestly that we were quite surprised to, this, uh, to see this high incidence of difficult intubation, uh, which is uh, actually even higher than uh, what we were expecting at the beginning of our study. So this was one of the first surprising results. Uh, when we look at the overall data from the, uh, the, from the whole cohort, we notice also that there is a, um, an incomplete using of monitoring and technology. And I'll tell you honestly that in particular, regarding uh, difficult innovation, we saw that the, te the technology is still lacking in many places. And I will show you in the next few slides. And finally, what is also, let's say, less surprising than the rest is that our patients are frequent flyers. It means that we have neonates undergoing multiple anesthesia in a very short period of time, and 50% of these children uh, are affected by a complex comorbidity. It means that even if you are dealing with a child undergoing a small procedure, you have to pay particular attention because they might have multiple comorbidity and there might be complex case, cases, even if the surgery is a, is a small and short surgery. If you look at the uh, number of attempts, uh, of course, by definition, we said that these children uh, were classified as difficult intubation when we, they had at least two unsuccessful attempts. So of course, the vast majority of these children had three or more attempts, and luckily, there were very few patients who had multiple attempts, like five, six, and we had few patients who had at least 10 attempts. Ten. This is very risky, but luckily, these are very few, few patients. 
Well, so when I told you that the technology probably needs to be implemented, I'm referring to the alternative tactic which was put in place when direct laryngoscopy was considered not, not the proper technique. So people decided to change, first of all, the uh, blade of the, laryngo the, of the laryngoscope which was used, and then they call for help, a second anesthesiologist or an expert, otolaryngologist expert in highway management. They use the style at Obuji, and, the, and uh, only 5% um, of these children underwent uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy. Some of these had blind intubation, rigid bronchoscopy, and so on and so on. But what was surprising was this result. Look at here. Only 13% of children had a video uh, laryngoscopy or video assisted intubation, which was, uh, let's say, a little bit surprising to me because with the uh, upcoming data, uh, and Henry will present some very interesting data regarding the use of video laryngoscopy, probably we might consider having video laryngoscopy readily available when we are in difficulty, or we might consider using as a first attempt, especially when we are working in an academic hospital where teaching is an important part of our job. And then, as, as I told you, um, we also collected data regarding the complication, the, the peri-intubation complication. So again, this was also surprising that 60%, 60% of these children had at least one complication during the intubation, which means that they might have had a drop, acute drop in oxygen, oxygenation below 85%. And they might also have uh, bradycardia are, are occurring at the same time. It means that if you have five children undergoing anesthesia when they are neonates, five of these might have a difficult intubation. Three of these also experience a complication during uh, the airway management attempt. Uh, then at the end, we had 90%, 97% of successful intubation. Very few children, three and three, uh, were classified as unsuccessful with the procedure which was uh, continued with face mask or laryngeal mask. All uh, or three children had to be woken up and the procedure postponed to another day. Nicola, do you, do you consider these results representative, these results from the difficult intubation for daily practice? So outside of the specialized centers? That's, that's a, a true important question. Of course, uh, uh, of course, this might in somehow represent the tip of the iceberg because uh, this is a prospective uh, cohort study. So there are complications or difficulty intubation which were reported. Of course, we don't know what happened to those children who might have had difficult intubation which was not reported. We don't have a clear idea of what happened uh, in those centers who didn't participate in the nectarine study, but at least we have a large picture, a large snapshot of Europe, and uh, uh, this is nearly well representative of what is happening every day in Europe for, cl for a clinical practice. At the end, um, we uh, wanted to compare those children who had a difficult intubation uh, occurrence with those who didn't have uh, the, the situation of difficult intubation, then we performed a propensity score. I know this is a very busy slide, but I think it's important to look at some of these results. Because if you compare the two population in a similar way and you perform a propensity score, you will see here that there is no difference between the use of neuromuscular block in those with difficult and those without difficult intubation. Even for the type of anesthesia and induction, you will see here that there is no difference in the use of inhalational induction or, or intravenous induction. It looks like that this is not a situation or a management that might affect the outcome of this patient. Likely, and this is, uh, let's say, the quite uh, positive data, which I'm going to highlight right now, is that the mortality, the morbidity, and the mortality of these children didn't change 
simply because the child had a difficult intubation situation, which is quite reassuring. It means that despite the high incidence, we still remain competent in highway management and we still remain competent in the uh, administration of sedatives and anesthetic drugs. This is quite reassuring data. Finally, so, so the next question for me for you is what's now the future? So we know it. What is the consequence? So should we change something in Europe or what what's what's the future as you say here? Future implication. Yes, yes, Tino. Uh, let's talk about, at least uh, from my side, and then I will be very pleased to answer all the questions from the audience, which are the implications from the nectarine study. Let me show this, again, busy uh, slide, which represents the new uh, American Society of Anesthesia algorithm, where we were called to um, uh, display our pediatric uh, algorithm. Of course, this is not representative for neonates, it's representative for the overall pediatric population. And then the panel of experts, and I was part of this panel, wanted to focus on three particular um, aspects of difficult intubation. First of all, you have to have a clear plan in your mind. So be prepared. Be prepared when you are performing an intubation on an airway management in a very small child. Be prepared. Have your plan hand A in mind and might have your plan B or perhaps even your plan C in mind because you might be ready to change your initial plan if needed. Second finding, please deliver oxygen at all time because we saw that there are a lot of these kids who had a nice view using direct, whatever it is, direct laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy, doesn't matter. But sometimes you have to stop your procedure simply because your child is desaturating, it might, is, it might have uh, also bradycardia. And then you have to stop your procedure. You, ventil you have to ventilate your child. You have to establish the normal condition. Please deliver oxygen because this might help you in performing a successful intubation. Third important take home message is that limit the number of attempts. We put here the magic number of three. Of course, three, four is, is not, there is not a magic number. I know that there are interesting data from the PEDI registry and even from the apricot study, but let's say we have to fix a certain number of attempts and we have to rethink and reconsider the overall scenario at every attempt. And finally, be, pay attention to uh, task fixation, loss aversion, all the conditions which are related to human factors, which brings you performing multiple attempts. So pay attention because time runs when you are performing eye management, especially in these very tiny uh, children. So all, all of these are the cases. Be prepared, have your plan, deliver oxygen, choose the best technique, which might be, let's see what Henry says, video laryngoscopy. Of course, you have to use the, the, the technique which you are most familiar with, but you might consider using video laryngoscopy as first attempt and avoid multiple attempts. We are pediatric anesthesiologists and we are the expert in highway management and we are also the expert in delivering the proper sedatives and anesthetic drugs. So I truly believe that we might be the crucial people performing highway management, especially in this very fragile population. So in conclusion, uh, let's say that we noticed that the nectar reported a very high number of difficult intubation with very high incidence of complication. Uh, luckily, there was no increase in morbidity and mortality, which brings to this conclusion that we might need uniform definition for difficult intubation because, of course, my, uh, sometimes it might be difficult to compare the nectar with other studies when we are changing the definition. Pay attention to the what, the how, the when, the where, and the who, which are the five W's of the Safe Thoughts motto, the Safe Thoughts initiatives. And ideally, we should work. And Anna knows that we are we are already working on this, uh, on uh, universal guidelines, which might be uh, uh, ready, uh, let's say, by next uh, next year. Uh, so, in conclusion, um, it was. Uh, very um, challenging experience, uh, the apricot, the nectarine, 
uh, we were able and uh, I think this is the most important achievement to establish uh, a very nice, a very strong European uh, pediatric anesthesia research network, which will be part of the European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Research Groups next year. And the plan is to expand the network to the rest of the world. We already did uh, some data collection with the PAUS COVID-19. So it's important that we start collaborating with our friends of the other side of the ocean. So we have very good collaboration with the PEDI registry. We will establish a nice collaboration with South America. We also have good collaborators in Australia. So the network is there and the network is working very well. It's not only for me and for you, it's there for everyone who wants to perform a large uh, international multi-center clinical trial network. So please use the network because it, it works and is very collaborative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, Nicola, for giving us this nice overview. From the audience, I have two very short questions you might answer immediately. One question is, were superglottic devices used to rescue failed intubations? That's a good question. Uh, actually, we have very few children and neonates who had uh, laryngeal mask. I think this is uh, something which might develop in future. It's not very well used in neonates. So uh, from the nectarine study, I cannot answer the, the question because people is not using laryngeal mask as a rescue technique. Okay, and the second like very short is, is, is it the difficult intubation more frequent in preterm neonates? Do you have to use, did you separate this in preterm units? Oh, well, uh, I, they, they, again, uh, the, the, the population, the population uh, is divided between 50% preterm and 50% terms. Uh, there was no difference according to preterm and term neonates. It was very well distributed among all these ages. It means that is the, 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 at that stage, the age doesn't change pretty much the occurrence of difficulty. Okay, thank you. And with this, it's end of my term. And now I switch over to Maren and Enery. Thank you very much, Tino. Thank you. A pleasure. Mara in microphone. Little detail, small detail. Thank you, Tino. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you, Tino. Um, great presentation. Uh, so we're now moving across the ocean to Enery, to the United States and the PD registry. And Enery actually also wanted to ask the audience a question before starting her talk. And the question is, um, do you routinely paralyze children with a known difficult airway for tracheal intubation? Yes or no? Do you routinely paralyze patients with known difficult airways for tracheal intubation? So again, we're gonna wait for a few moments to have the uh, audience vote. And I'm very curious to um, see the results. And I'm also very curious to then listen to Henry's reply to this question. All right, and here's the reply. So uh, interesting, only a quarter of the audience paralyzes patients with known difficult airways uh, when they want to perform a tracheal intubation and three quarters don't. Um, that's very interesting. Anari, I'm looking forward to see what you have to, to say to this, these results. Anari. Excellent, Anari thank you very uh, much. Very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, Enery is going to uh, talk about the PD registry, so the difficult intubation registry in kids. Um, so if you just want to go ahead and, and tell us what this registry actually is, what it contains, and what the purpose is of this registry. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me um, to give this presentation today. It's a pleasure. So I'm going to talk to you about the PD registry and some lessons that we have learned from the PD registry. So I have nothing to disclose, but I want to start off with asking you, imagine that you're on a vacation. It's been a really long time with everything going on since any of us had had a real vacation, right? But for this vacation, you don't get to take many things. In fact, you don't get to take your iPhone. You don't get to take any special cameras. You get to take this. 
this camera here. Okay, so you don't get to see what the pictures look like before you share it with family members or post it on social media if you like to do those things. There are no retakes. And what if you don't get the 36 film, the 36 pictures that are on the film that Kodak promises? What if you just got one picture, one chance? How would you prepare? So I am here to tell you about how to prepare for this event what I consider a critical moment. You're about to induce this infant and perform tracheal intubation. How are you gonna do it? What are you gonna use? What's your initial airway management plan? What device are you gonna start off with? What's your backup plan? Would anybody paralyze this patient? So this talk is gonna focus on what we learned from PD, and I have three objectives for you for today to describe specific risk factors in children with difficult airways that increase complications, to describe advantages of various indirect laryngoscopy devices and techniques, and to think about a plan and formulating a management plan for anesthetic depth and maintenance of anesthetic depth when intubating a child with a difficult airway. So this is the PD registry. It's a multi-center quality improvement database that collects information and outcomes in children with difficult airways. As you can see that there are many sites, both uh, in the US and internationally, and it's grown quite a lot. So what happens is the centers um, log into the registry, they use standard data collection methods and provide information on the patient's demographics, preoperative plan and case data. And so, so regarding- I mean, I may just interrupt you. Um, so you're saying that this registry was focusing on these complications um, and I know many studies actually focus on complications, but the definition is actually very um, different in many studies. So how did you, for the PD registry, define those complications that you wanted to measure? Right. Yeah, complications, they were categorized as severe and non-severe complications. And these were used by modifying the operational definitions from the National Emergency Airway Registry for Children, near for kids. And so they're, again, broken down into non-severe versus severe complications. Non-severe complications being hypoxemia, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, esophageal intubation with immediate recognition, and severe complications being pneumothorax, pulmonary aspiration, delayed recognition of esophageal intubation, cardiac arrest. Okay, okay, that, that makes sense. But again, why do you even care about the non-severe complications if, just, if I can just ask this provocative question? I mean, a laryngospasm that doesn't lead to a cardiac arrest because of hypoxia or hypoxemia, why do you even care about it? It doesn't have a direct consequence for the child. That's a great question. And many times people do ask, well, why, why do you care about a little bit of hypoxemia, right? So the patient's saturation goes to 88 for two or three seconds. What does that matter? I can ventilate them and pick it right back up. But the thing is that these non-severe complications are the pathway to the severe complications like cardiac arrest. So this was the first study from the PD registry it was done um, between August 2012 and January 2015. It involved 13 sites and over a thousand children with difficult airways. And what was found was that the most frequently attempted, uh, the most frequently used device for first tracheal intubation attempt was direct laryngoscopy, 46%, followed by fiber optic bronchoscopy and video laryngoscopy with devices such as the GlideScope. So thinking about, well, what were the success rates with these devices? Look at this. First, some success rates, the most frequently used device in these difficult airways, direct laryngoscopy, 3% first attempt success rate compared with higher success rates with indirect techniques. Hmm. Very interesting. Henry, what patient population do you think is at greatest risk for, for complications? Yes, yeah, so similar to what we heard with apricot, the smaller, the riskier. Children less than 10 kilos were at higher risk for complications. So let's quickly dive into some of the lessons learned from PD. So 
Next lesson here, limit the number of intubation attempts. Sometimes, you know, we're called in the middle of the night and we're asked, hey, we're having trouble with this airway. And we've had, you know, the med student has tried, a different provider has tried, a fellow, a resident, you know, an attending from a different service. And now somebody wants, you know, oh, I'm going to be better at it. You know, let me take a stab at direct laryngoscopy. But let's let's think about challenging that mindset for a second, because we're trying to avoid this and worse things than this from happening. Okay, I, I agree. This looks awful. <laughs> Definitely want, don't want this to happen. But again, medical students and all these different people you mentioned need to learn to do this. So how many attempts of direct laryngoscopy are allowed? How many attempts of thir direct laryngoscopy are too many? So we learned from the PD registry that the occurrence of a complication is associated with the number of attempts. So the odds of having a complication increase by 1.5 for each attempt. So limit the number of attempts. This is so important. And perseverance is just not your friend. Okay, cases where direct laryngoscopy was used for the first three attempts had more complications. So no more than two attempts. Hopefully, not even that. And when you stop, direct laryngoscopy matters. So you see here from the data that when you had an early transition from direct laryngoscopy to an indirect technique compared to a late transition, had a difference in complications. You had more complications when you had a later transition. So from that first PD study, in summary, the occurrence of complications were associated with patients that are less than 10 kilos, so the smallest patients, a short thyromental distance, more than two direct laryngoscopy attempts, and persistence of direct laryngoscopy. So I would say switch to an indirect technique early, if not start with one. And other studies from the PD registry were then performed. In this study, the efficacy of the glide scope compared to direct laryngoscopy was queried. And what was found was that the initial and eventual success for the glide scope compared to direct laryngoscopy was greater across all patients, okay? However, the magnitude of that effect was lower in those patients, the vulnerable patients, less than 10 kilos. So still, video laryngoscopy was more successful, but just a little less so compared to the rest of the um, patients that were greater than 10 kilos. So what do we do for these patients, right? So then this next study that was done um, found that using a supraglottic device, so fiber optic intubation via a supraglottic airway had greater success in those patients that were less than one years old, so the smaller patients. And a part of that could also be that you have continuous ventilation through the supraglottic airway. You're oxygenating and ventilating the patient, so that might actually lower the risk of complications. So why do people turn to direct laryngoscopy so frequently in children, particularly in infants? And there are various reasons for that, including controversial data, and we'll have more information on that soon, clinician comfort and what's available, but is it time to adapt to new and better technology? You might say to me, Okay, yes, yes, fine, but I've got this down. I am very good at direct laryngoscopy, especially in infants. I don't really need this other stuff. And, and I understand you, I do. You know, I'm also one that likes to use the tools that I'm comfortable with and do things in a traditional way, write things down with a pencil and paper. That's, that's me, okay? Like, in this sense. Emma. 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 So sometimes old is good, right? But what about normal airways? 
everything we've discussed so far has been in patients with difficult airways that come to the PD registry, right? So, so let's talk about that for a second. So there was a Cochrane review that looked at video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy in children. Um, there were about 12 studies over 800 patients and they found no difference between the two devices in first attempt success. They did find a longer intubation time with VL compared to DL and that maybe the use of VL improved the percentage of glottic opening. Okay, but if you look carefully at this, the investigators themselves tell you that the quality of the evidence was low and there was very serious heterogeneity in these studies. Fine. We look at the next Cochrane review, which asked the same question, but in neonates, VL versus DL, first attempt success, neonates. They had a couple of uh, randomized control trials. They looked at over 300 intubations. They found no difference in time to intubation, no difference in desaturation, and maybe increase in first attempt success rate with VL, but not quite sure of that. And again, the same problem, lots of heterogeneity with these studies. So. Anyway, that's what? actually very surprising. Yeah, I just wanted to ask this question. Why is there all this heterogeneity? Because actually we just want to know what is best for intubation. And that seems to be a very simple outcome parameter that should be very easy to measure. Why all this heterogeneity? Right, fair point. Yes, lots of heterogeneity because in these studies, they compiled standard video laryngoscopy with non-standard video laryngoscopy, hyperangulated blades with non-hyperangulated blades. So they were all kind of jumbled up together and not distinguished when the study question was asked. And so standard video laryngoscopy, a standard video laryngoscope is a laryngoscope, a video laryngoscope that you can perform direct laryngoscopy with, that you would use the same technique, that if I weren't looking at the screen or camera, I can still DL with, right? And hyperangulated blades, we're talking about like the classic traditional glide scope type blade or the CMAC D blade that requires a different technique. So you can't compare these and jumble them together. These are not the same thing, right? It's like saying that a cat is like a tiger. They're two different animals. So the next recent PD study actually um, asked the question about comparing video laryngoscopy with standard blades compared to non-standard blades. And this was led by uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Jamie Payton. And what was found was interesting. So in infants that weigh less than five kilos, video laryngoscopy with standard blades was associated with greater success than video laryngoscopy with non-standard blades. Okay, and so we might have some questions about that and about what are we doing and the technique with uh, non-standard blades in the youngest patients. So we decided to then put on another study and answer this question, hopefully answer this question once and for all. So the question was first attempt success rate of video laryngoscopy in, in infants, those less than 12 months, Okay, this was a randomized control trial that we uh, performed. And now this is comparing standard blade video laryngoscopy compared to standard blade direct laryngoscopy. Okay, so now we can compare apples to apples. All right, and here you see that um, we started with a good number of patients and eventually had around 270 patients in each arm, the video laryngoscopy and direct laryngoscopy arm. We had five centers, um, mostly in the US, uh, one center in Australia. And as you can see, there was pretty good balance between the two groups, video laryngoscopy and direct laryngoscopy. Um, maybe a lower gestational age in the video laryngoscopy group compared to DL, that was the only thing. But other than that, uh, the most common factors balanced pretty well. As far as the induction technique, most were inhaled. Again, same balance between inhaled and intravenous induction. And nearly all the patients in this study were paralyzed, okay? We're talking about healthy infant airways paralyzed because we didn't want that to be a confounder between the two groups. And then here you notice, again, we achieve balance with the experience of the operator in both arms. Experience with VL and DL. So what did we find? We found that video laryngoscopy 
compared to direct laryngoscopy had greater first attempt success, okay, with an improvement in first attempt success rate of 5% in the video laryngoscopy group, okay? And then we noticed a couple other things, differences in severe complications between the two groups, differences in the rates of esophageal intubation between both groups. We found 5% improvement in first attempt success, fewer severe complications, fewer esophageal intubations. So if we think about this, okay. Oh, one more thing. Cricoid or laryngeal, external laryngeal manipulation. So when you have to say to somebody when they're performing DL, hey, can you give me a little bit of external laryngeal manipulation, a little bit of cricoid? You had to do that less frequently in the video laryngoscopy group. And a part of that is likely because you share a view, right? And this is no surprise. There was another study um, performed in the neonatal setting where um, among junior pediatric residents, their first attempt success really is, is low, less than 50%. And however, that improved significantly when the uh, attending, okay, and the resident were able to share a screen and share a view. So this diagram here from the VISI study also gives you a little bit more information. So greater first attempt success with video laryngoscopy compared to direct laryngoscopy across all the infants, but particularly those less than 6.5 kilos, the magnitude of the difference in first attempt success was greater. So not just a 5% improvement, like a 12% improvement in first attempt success. So I think that's huge. So let's say, you know, we did a little math in the study and, you know, looked up some information. Let's assume 1.5 million infants have surgery and about 500,000 of those require intubation. If you can improve first attempt success from 88% to 93% based on our findings, you would possibly prevent 10,500 esophageal intubations, 10,500 fewer opportunities for aspiration, 10,500 fewer opportunities for cardiac arrest, 10,500 fewer opportunities for neurologic injury. So I have three kids and whenever I take care of a patient, I think about my own children. I think about what would I want you to do if you were taking care of my child? What can I do to optimize the situation for this baby in front of me? So we go back to this patient for a second. How many people would paralyze this patient? Let's change gears. What would you do for this patient? What would you use? And would you paralyze this patient? So that's the next question. Another question we had for the PD registry. What is the impact of neuromuscular blocking drugs in children with difficult airways? Are they helpful or not? That led us to this study. Okay, and in this study, we looked at only anticipated difficult airways. There were about 1,200 of those. And then we broke them down into those with spontaneous ventilation, controlled ventilation with muscle relaxant, and controlled ventilation without muscle relaxant. Okay, and the question is, same question, what are the complication rates between these three initial techniques? Controlled with muscle relaxant, controlled without muscle relaxant, spontaneous. So what we found was very surprising. Spontaneous ventilation had more complications compared to controlled with muscle relaxant and controlled without muscle relaxant. So of course we're like, really? Really? That's not what we expected to find. So of course we did a multivariable logistic regression. We controlled for these variables that you see here. And just to be extra sure, we did propensity score matching. So not just is the patient's syndromic yes or no, but what kind of syndrome does the patient have? Not just whether they had an abnormal airway exam, yes or no, but exactly where the abnormality of that exam lies. Is it a fused cervical spine, micronathia, limited mouth opening? And then as you can see, um, looking at the absolute standardized difference uh, being more to the left of 0.1, we achieved pretty good balance between the group. And with propensity score matching, we found still the odds ratio of having a complication when spontaneous ventilation is used is greater. 
Specifically, these were non-severe, again, back to the non-severe complications, hypoxemia, the pathway to severe complications, right? Cardiac arrest and worse. So, so you might say, again, why is this important? Again, this is the pathway to the bad things that we want to avoid. And then I want you to look at another thing here. So spontaneous ventilation, greater complications compared to controlled with muscle relaxant and controlled without, which had the same lower rate of complications. So is it the muscle relaxant that's making the difference? Why would this be? And this, this was kind of the thought process, the mental model. So maybe with spontaneous ventilation, you might have decreased anesthetic depth, more airway response, airway reactivity, and therefore more complications. And we were able to capture that in the registry. We were able to see whether airway reactivity occurred during that attempt, yes or no, and found that spontaneous ventilation was associated with more airway reactivity compared to the other two techniques. And that was really mediating the relationship with complications. And just as another way to look at it, when you look at combined techniques, like when you're using a video laryngoscopy and fiber optic scope together, okay, which takes longer, they you know, take a little bit more time, require more instrumentation of the airway, can have more noxious stimulation, you have greater number of intubation attempts with a combined technique when spontaneous ventilation is used, okay? Suggesting more reactivity. Back to this scary airway. A certain depth of anesthetic is usually maintained with any kind of controlled ventilation, simply to have the patient in synchrony with the mechanical breaths that you provide. And sometimes with spontaneous ventilation, an adequately deep plane of anesthetic can be overestimated easily. And we know children and especially young infants have greater oxygen consumption rates and can desaturate really quickly. So, you know, again, it's very important to pay close attention to your anesthetic depth. So you don't necessarily have to paralyze these patients, but you really need to make sure that the anesthetic depth is right for every single move of, of the airway management that you're doing. And that anesthetic depth requirement might be different at, a, at every different state and stage of that intubation attempt, right? And passive oxygenation can delay the onset of hypoxemia. So we've learned a lot from the PD registry. Multiple intubation attempts increase complications. Indirect laryngoscopy techniques can improve first attempt success in children with difficult airways. You got to know your blade types, standard versus non-standard blades, and the differences in their techniques. Standard video laryngoscopy can be more effective in children compared to non-standard blades in those less than five kilos specifically. And standard VL is associated with increased first attempt success in children with normal airways. Anesthetic depth matters. So formulate a plan for that. So back to that vacation, you get one shot, okay? And even if it's not perfect, put all you have into it to make it the best that you can. Thank you very much. Amazing talk. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. There are a few questions from the audience, actually. And um, I just want to um, ask a few very quick questions. And uh, one question here from the audience is uh, that um, direct laryngoscopy might be used so frequently just because we do not have proper teaching on the new newer techniques like video laryngoscopy. What do you think about this? And do you think, do you have um, specific teaching plans, workshops or anything like that at your institution? Yes, yes. So certainly we need to teach more about video laryngoscopy and, and still maintain our direct laryngoscopy skills. We do have workshops and prior to all this, we put on a lot of live workshops um, at our national meetings and you know we traveled to, to um, have these workshops happen as well. Um, and, and also using video laryngosco laryngoscopy specifically when you're talking about standard blade video laryngoscopy, you can use it in three ways, right? You can use it as pure VL, you can use it as DL or you can use it as video assisted DL and you can play around with it. And, you know, sometimes with the training,
trainee that you have with your residents and other trainees decide, okay, today I'm going to do it like this, or in this patient, I'm going to use it as VL, in this patient, I'm going to use it as DL. And that way you maintain your skills at the same time, you're always able to coach the person doing the intubation. Because you could always look at that video screen and say, hey, back up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely agree. I actually have um, one question to you myself, and that actually goes along with a question from the audience. So um, do you think there are any situations where it is of crucial importance to maintain spontaneous breathing? Let's say, I don't know, a mediastinal mass, a, a tumor in the airway, a cyst, or uh, subglottic stenosis, any situation you might think of where man maintenance of spontaneous breathing is crucial. And if you do maintain spontaneous breathing, then the question from the audience is whether uh, or what you think of local anesthesia to the airway to prevent reflexes. Like Absolutely. That is that is a great point. And, and yes, and I, just to clarify, the message of that ventilation technique paper is not go ahead and paralyze everybody, right? Yes, that's very favorable when you can do that, but pay attention to anesthetic depth and, and work on maintenance of anesthetic depth. Now, completely agree, there are definitely airways that you do not wanna paralyze, such as the ones that you mentioned, mediastinal masses, tumors in the airway, bleeding, and you know, and these kinds of things, cysts. And so, uh, mucopolysaccharidosis, right? So in, in some of those patients, Yes, local anesthesia to topicalize the airway will be very helpful. And also an incremental approach to how you maintain your anesthetic depth and how you provide the sedation for the airway. So for example, in a patient with hurler hunters, I might have them inhale lidocaine, okay? Um, so that can help numb the airway. I might have them come back, get an IV, and then give a little bit of midazolam and dexmedetomidine in incremental doses until an NP airway can be placed in their nose and I can modify an NP airway and I can ventilate in a shore ventilation. And then now that I've got that step, I'll proceed with now a higher level of sedative, so on and so forth. But making sure that that is also provided in a graded, careful manner. Can you provide some examples? I mean, you say, you mentioned the hurler. Um... Are there examples where you think that uh, maintenance of spontaneous breathing is crucial? Mediastinal masses, for sure, especially when a patient tells you, I can't lay flat. I mean, that's, you know, big one, right, where we don't want to paralyze right away. Um, you know, even having some of these uh, patients with, let's say, Pierre Robin, you know, not all, some can be paralyzed, but you come back, they have not had any mandibular distract distractions or anything like that, and, you know, you, you're suspecting potentially difficulty with mask ventilation, right? Or you cannot assure that you can mask ventilate them. That might be an instance where you want to be careful and want to assure that you can oxygenate and ventilate this patient first before providing muscle relaxant, if that's the choice. But certainly you can achieve the intubation without providing the muscle relaxant, just making sure that whatever it is you provide along the way, the right anesthetic depth is achieved before the next move happens. Yeah, I guess that's the crucial point that if you paralyze, you need to be sure you will be able to mask ventilate because paralysis, paralysis will improve intubation success. And in some situations, it might increase mask ventilation success. But if you can't mask ventilate, then you're in trouble. All right. right. Thank and you very much, January. Thank you. Uh, may I ask directly, Nicola, because we talked about the teaching situation, what's the teaching situation in Europe? I know there are a lot of discussions of having a, a subspeciality of pediatric anesthesiologists. Maybe you could go a little bit into the European situation. Yes. So, um, first of all, as Anri said, uh, of course, I think it is time to change our approach. It, it means that we need to change the way we are teaching airway management in our junior doctors. So definitely we might consider teaching in a proper way how to use, when to use all these techniques because it, it's like for the wine. If you are the sommelier, you are the expert in wine and we are pediatric anesthesiologists, we must be experts in highway management. We might know all these techniques and how and when to apply. 
In terms of teaching, that's a very burning point, actually, because we discussed many times the need of having a proper pediatric anesthesia curriculum in Europe, and perhaps uh, the um, higher management curriculum could be part of this curriculum. Of course, we might need to provide evidence that people are, uh, are using, are able to use the techniques, not only the device, but also the medications, assess the situation, uh, have the access to plan A and to plan B. Uh, so we need to provide evidence that people are, um, are, are achieving achieve the, the, the goal for uh, properly managing the highway and properly teaching, especially where we are thinking about uh, academic uh, hospitals. That's why we always say that it's important that we think outside the box. It means that one size that fits to all patients doesn't exist, and we might need to tailor uh, the approach to every patient. That's why we need to have all this armamentarium ready in our hands, not only the device, but the technique we, with the technique which are approaching. So we are working on this pediatric anesthesia curriculum uh, I cannot tell you how far we are because there are many implications, of course, but I think this one day will be the goal. Good. May I ask uh, Miguel from the technical support to give us the first survey again to see if there's a difference. And while we are waiting for this, there's a question from the audience from the American situation for Henry. Uh, here a colleague from California, uh, from the south of the United States is asking, should we di teach direct laryngoscopy in academic institution or should we abandon this? We should still teach it. We should still teach it. And um, again, like I said, with video laryngoscopy, you can use it in those three ways with standard video laryngoscopy, but it, it's not to abandon direct laryngoscopy because there might be circumstances in which you have tons of blood in the airway and no video in the world is going to save you. So you will, you will need to trust your direct laryngoscopy skills in a circumstance like that. So yes, keep DL, learn VL. Okay, and in the meantime, please answer the question on the use of ly direct laryngoscopy. Maybe you changed your mind. And when we get the answers, we will have the second question again uh, about the use of muscular relaxants. Maybe I'll to both of you, a question about uh, if everything fails, what's the best technique for a tracheostomy, tracheotomy in the children? Here we have the change in the, so it's, it's uh, quite interesting. A lot of people are considering a change in their clinical practice. That's nice. And Good. with this, yeah, a comment, Nicola. Uh, a comment about the, the poll or a comment about a the comment about the poll and then about the e-phone well 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 actually i'm I, i'm pretty happy that people might consider using different techniques as first approach and again uh, i think that the message arrived to the um, to the audience uh, think outside the box again one size uh, one one mm, one technique doesn't fit to every patient, so you might need to adapt. But of course, we have to consider the video laryngos we could be the first choice, uh, especially when we are dealing with small children. Uh, in regards to your question, the fauna, uh, I might say that the best fauna in your life is that one that you never perform. Because of course, it's the situation that you wouldn't like to be with. And uh, of course, um, you have to practice with fauna in the lab. You have to uh, know at least the technique. Uh, it could be an idea to work in collaboration sometimes with, uh, with, um, uh, with otolaryngol uh, otolaryngoscopists. Even if I think that the, the, the surgical technique is the best for small neonates because the needle is very tricky to perform, especially when you are in an emergency scenario with a child in an unstable condition. So at least this is my point. Okay. I don't know if Henry has different yeah, opinions. 
I agree. I think EFONA, the best EFONA is the one you don't have to perform. Emergency front of neck access is very difficult, especially in small children and infants. Um, and I think we're beginning to learn from uh, work from Dr. Thomas Riva that maybe a, a tracheotomy approach might be a better approach potentially in infants and in, in younger children. So something to consider there. And Irina, Nicola, there um, are two very brief questions from the audience. Uh, which video laryngoscopy model do you use? Which works best for you? And also, you mentioned the uh, continuous oxygenation techniques. Uh, how do you actually perform this? And what type of continuous oxygenation do you use? Uh, is it for me? For both of you, actually. Nicola, if you want to start. OK, OK. Uh, shall I start? Yes. So, um, uh, of course, there is no standardization for this. At least we use uh, the nasal uh, the, the nasal tube. I mean, when we, we, we perform the vast majority of tracheal intubation in neonates uh, via nasotracheal uh, route, and we do administer one liter per kg of oxygen through the nasal tube. Whenever we do a uh, um, uh, oral uh, intubation, we do deliver oxygen through nasal prongs and uh, we use one liter per kg. Uh, there is not much evidence on how much oxygen we might need to use, but this is the technique with, that we usually we use in our institution. So do you place a suction tube or anything like this in the nasal tube or how do you deliver? Well, I, I, I connect directly the, uh, the uh, bag, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the TPs to the, to the nasal tube once I pass through the nose, if I'm intubating through the nose. Otherwise, I put nasal prongs uh, when I do oral yeah. intubation. All right. And Anne-Marie, what about you? Yeah, so it depends on the situation, right? I think first and foremost, regarding which video laryngoscope to use, depends on where the difficulty of the difficult airway lives, if it's because we're choosing this for a difficult airway. So if you're telling me, I think that this face is very posterior. This patient is severely retronathic, mitronathic, and I feel like the airway is going to be, it's going to feel anterior, right? So I need something, it's gonna be at an acute angle. So I need something that will help me see that acute angle. So a hyperangulated blade would probably be my choice, let's say in that Piero band baby that might appear that way. Now, if it's a normal infant, you know, just a very small but normal infant, two kilos healthy, I probably would use standard blade video laryngoscopy, so regular CMAC blade. And regarding how to provide the passive oxygenation, it depends on what is the airway technique I'm using. So, you know, let's say if I'm doing a na uh, nasal fiber optic intubation, I probably would put a modified NP airway, okay, to be able to ventilate through the other side. If it's a supraglottic, via supraglottic approach, then that's how I'm providing passive oxygenation. If it's, I'm using the glide scope on a baby, nasal cannula. So it depends on what you're doing. All right, so the good old doctor's reply, it, it depends. <laughs> but that's just how it is. I mean, there is no one way that it would be too simple, isn't it? You have to get creative. Yeah. <laughs> Enary, a comment on the, on the result of, of the Second survey on paralyzing patients, small kids. <laughs> yes. So yes, so we went from, if you can show or tell me the results again, they kind of flashed briefly for me. It was nine. Yeah, so, so very, yeah. Very deep. Yeah. <laughs> so people still are starting to think about it. Yeah, I think yes, you. you have to take it situation by situation. Okay, and I guess with this, it's Anna Isabel's round and Marin to round up all this stuff. Yes, yeah, so Marin will present briefly the take home uh, messages. And while she's uh, putting up the, the PowerPoint, I would like to remind all of your audience that if you wish a certificate to be issued uh, about your participation in this webinar, please send an email to our secretariat. Okay, Maren, up to you. All right, thank you. So um, 
I just want to repeat the key messages because this is really for the audience to take home. So key messages from uh, the Nectarine study, which uh, Nicola presented to us, um, is to really consider neonatal airways as difficult. Just go with the worst and then uh, if it's easy, even better. Um, deliver oxygen throughout the procedure. And we did hear a few um, different techniques to do this and uh, think outside the box. And then um, key messages from Anery from the PD registry were um, that multiple tracheal intubation attempts really do increase complications. So we should, con we really should make every effort to, to uh, limit tracheal intubation attempts. Um, with difficult airways in children, indirect laryngoscopy techniques improve the first attempt success rate. And even in children with normal airways, video laryngoscopy also seems to be favorable in that um, standard video laryngoscopy is associated with an increased first attempt success rate in children with normal airways. And I think um, Henry really made a point that the anesthetic depth matters a lot in, in, in kids. And I hand over to Anna. Thank you. So that sums up our webinar, today's webinar. I'd like to thank you, all of you that attended this webinar. I definitely think it met up your expectations. Also, a big thank you to our fantastic speakers, Nicola and Henry, for joining us. It was quite eye-opening, the, all their their insight on this, on this matter. And the European Area Management Society will do a little break in August, and then we'll start at beginning of September with our webinar series. And on September the 9th, we will be talking about improving human factors in airway management. So please stay tuned. And thank you for attending this webinar. Remember, if you wish to uh, see again uh, this webinar and have access to the supportive material that our speakers, Henry and Nicola, kindly send us. Please become a member of EMS and you'll have access to all of this in the EMS uh, members' uh, private area at our website. Having this say, please keep safe and stay well and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.